So you have an exam on Friday, and the deal was that I was going to come unprepared today. I do not have any material to present to you. I have come to answer questions for the next 50 minutes. So I turn this over to you. If you have questions, you want to make me jump through some hoops, do some party tricks, let me have it. Yes, sir. Can you explain uh, from homework uh, six, number three? Homework six, number three, coming up. First, I have to find what was homework six, number three. Problem one, problem th Oh, good. So problem three is I give you the step response of a circuit. And I ask you to get a reasonable sketch of the magnitude filter response. So um, since I don't feel like pulling down the projector, essentially what I'm showing you is a impulse response, sorry, a step response that looks roughly like that. And it's about five milliseconds. And this is about one. Okay, so that's my step response of the circuit. We want to, you're being asked to plot the transfer function. So in other words, this is a time representation of how the circuit works. I want to know the frequency representation of how that circuit works. So, what kind of circuit do I have? Underdamped, Underdamped second order circuit, right? Is there any way this could be the step response of a first order circuit? No! First order circuit only ever gives you the RC, like, charge or discharge. So, you've got a underdamped system, it's ringing. This is a underdamped second order system. What will the transfer function look like for this low pass filter? Low pass with the peak. Low pass with the peak. Can we all agree on that? So low pass, a little bit of a peak, then a roll off. What's the gain at the low frequencies? Zero dB. Not the same as just zero, right? I mean, we've got to make sure we, we get that right. The gain of zero dB is the same as a gain of just one. Output equals input. What's my roll-off? What's that slope? Negative 40. Why? Because I have two poles. Each pole contributes negative 20 dB per decade. In the overdamped system, those poles activate at different frequencies. In the underdamped system, those poles activate at the same frequency. Now, that would have gotten you, if this was a test question, this would have gotten you almost all the points. This would have gotten you like three quarters of the way there. The only thing that's missing is, I want to know roughly where that is, and maybe some indication of how big the bump is. So, let's start with let's start with the uh, the, the, the the frequency here. Roughly speaking, where is my resonant frequency going to be? Omega naught. How can I get omega naught from the step response? Yeah, omega naught is the natural oscillating frequency of the circuit, right? What have I done here? I've kicked the circuit, right? I just doink, here's some input. Okay, and the circuit, right? The, the circuit just kind of like vibrated in response to that. That's the natural vibration frequency of the circuit, which happens to be, that's exactly where you're going to see your resonant peak. So all you got to do is come and measure the frequency of this circuit, of, the, of this step response. So according to this, my first peak is at roughly half a millisecond. My second peak is at roughly one and a half milliseconds. What's my period? What's my frequency in hertz? 1,000, right? 1 over T. So it's 1 over T 
which is 1,000 hertz. And I don't need, just need f, I need omega. So it's going to be 2 pi times that. So 2 pi times 1,000 rads per second. So there you go. So this omega naught happens at whatever 2 times pi times 1,000 is. If you feel the need to calculate that on your calculator, go nuts. Go nuts. Yes, sir? Is there a, like a relationship between the frequency of the period and the omega dot that you can calculate zeta without knowing like r? No, they're independent. Right, and that was sort of the whole thing with the... Um, that was the whole thing with the transfer with the uh, the characteristic equation, right? <coughs> right there, you, you can always calculate omega naught. You know, omega naught is what one over um, <coughs> LC squared, right? And this is usually um, uh, R over L. Oh, I'm, sorry, I'm forgetting. It's R if it's a series, it's R over L. If it's a series, it's R over L. Okay. So the point is that you can pick your, you can get your omega naught, and then once you've got that, you can separately dial your, independently dial your zeta by picking your resistor. So there's no way, just by knowing omega naught, you can know zeta. They're independent of each other. Even if you know the frequency. Yeah, even if you know the frequency. Okay, so how can we get zeta? Well, first of all, what does zeta tell me about this peak? Right. So if I made, so what are my range of values for zeta? zeta? This is underdamped. Therefore, zeta must be between 0 and 1. If you tell me zeta is negative 4, you lose. If you tell me zeta is 87, you lose. All right? Uh, not in this circuit. I mean, zeta can never be negative, and it can only be bigger than 1 if the system is overdamped. So you must give me a number between 0 and 1. So if I made zeta closer to 0, what would happen to that peak? It would get bigger. It would get peakier. Right? Peak, peakier is a word. Right? So the closer... So if you make uh, zeta smaller, this peak, you, you make your peak bigger. If you make so this is so this is zeta getting um, so this is zeta approaches zero, and if you go down, then you get zeta approaches one. Good. So, uh, well, how can I estimate my zeta? How 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 can zeta be estimated from the uh, from the plot that I've shown you? Time constant. How? Well, what does zeta affect, first of all? The decay rate, right? The frequency is set by the oscillations, but then separately from that, you've got a decay rate. All right? So if the circuit, it could decay slowly, or it could decay quickly. But the point is, is that decay rate is defined by zeta. So let's just start by estimating what is the time constant. And then once we know the time constant, we'll talk about what to actually do with that information. So what is the time constant for that, for that problem? Yeah, roughly one millisecond. How do I know it's one millisecond? It takes five milliseconds for that ringing to totally disappear. And we've, our rule of thumb is that five time constants is, is usually enough to make something disappear. So if five time constants is five milliseconds, then at least good enough for a back of the envelope calculation, we can figure out that my time constant is one millisecond. Pretty good, right? As I'm working this problem, I want you to think about exam-taking technique. What's interesting about this problem is that we, got, we were able to get most of the points by doing very little work. Isn't that interesting? 
now we're working harder and harder to earn fewer and fewer points. Right? Seriously. I mean, getting the picture was pretty good. That was conceptual, and it was relatively straightforward. No calculations. Then we had to work a little bit to get a few more points to calculate the frequency. That's not so bad. Now i got to calculate zeta. That's going to take me a couple minutes, and it's probably going to get me like an extra two or three points on a 20-point problem. So it's just interesting, like when you budget your time on an exam, um, just think about, you know, think about knocking off the easy points and then circling back and uh, dealing with the nasty ones. Okay, so how do I translate tau, the time constant, into zeta? Because it's not just zeta. Omega naught's one over tau. Nope. So let's do this. So characteristic equation is s squared plus 2 zeta omega naught s plus omega naught squared. Assuming for a second, assuming for a second that the system is underdamped, meaning zeta is between 0 and 1, what are the roots of this equation? How, what would happen if we applied the quadratic equation to solve for s. We've looked at this a little bit. Does anybody remember? Zeta negative zeta omega naught plus or minus j omega naught root one minus zeta squared. Beautiful. Okay. What does what does that number tell me? That's actually the oscillation frequency of the circuit. So this number here, I've written it as omega naught. It's actually not omega naught. It's actually omega naught times this little correction factor. But it turns out that it's, you can almost, I don't really ever worry about that. That doesn't change your, your answer by all that much. Okay. So I always say, I always say, I mean, technically this is, shouldn't just be at omega naught, it should be at omega naught times root 1 minus zeta squared, but that root 1 minus zeta squared doesn't really change your answer all that much. So that's, I, that's a detail I'm happy to sweep under the rug. And the reason I can do that is that if I wanted a really precise answer, I'd be using a computer anyway. Right? This is just to kind of give me a, a general feel for how things are going to work out. Okay, so that sets my oscillation frequency. So remember the imaginary part, imaginary frequencies always deal with oscillations. But now I've also got the real component. One second to set. That's your decay rate. That's your time constant. Right? Do you remember when we talked about first order circuits? We talked about the solution being e to the minus st, where s was a real number. There you go. So how do you get from how do you get from this number to tau? One over that. And we talked about that. Remember, e to the negative st can be expressed as e to the minus t over tau. So in other words, if you take the reciprocal of this frequency, you'll get the time constant. So tau is going to equal one over zeta omega naught. There's a lot going on in this problem, and that's why I put it as a, as a homework question, right? So we could bring these issues to the surface and discuss them. Um, I get that this is um, not obvious. Are there any questions on what I've just done? Yes, sir. Uh, I mean, S is just 1 over tau? The real part of S is 1 over tau. Right, always. And that's consistent with what we did with first order differential equations. Right? Remember when we did first order differential equations, we solved for s. And then if we wanted to know what the time constant of the circuit was, we did one over that. It's the same, the same thing. So according to this, now I can rearrange that. Zeta is going to be 1 over tau omega naught. And if I sub in the numbers that I have, um, I've got 1, uh, I've got 10 to the minus 3. That's my millisecond tau times 2 times pi times... A thousand. Oh, that's nice. 
You're welcome. Okay, those cancel. I'm left with one over two pi. Two pi is one six. One six is basically point one five and change, right? Point one six, whatever. Okay, did zeta come out between zero and one? Yes, it did. We satisfied? I am. Okay, so this is you know relatively close to zero. So I would we didn't really talk about how to calculate exactly how big the peak is, and I don't care. But I would just kind of draw you know a little extra peaky because it's you know bigger than a half, whatever. So just to close the loop. Let's calculate root 1 minus zeta squared to see how big, how, how far off our answer we would have been had we actually included that correction. It's actually not that big, right? So what is root 1 minus zeta squared for zeta equals 1 over 2 pi? Shall I look it up too? See two pi times reciprocal squared sine one plus root point nine eight. Yep, I'm getting the same thing. So, in other words, if we had gone to all that extra trouble of doing the radical one minus zeta squared, our answer would have been off by about two percent. All right, so this answer is off by about two percent. Who cares? I mean, good luck finding a resistor that's within two percent of its indicated value anyway, right? It's it's all at some point there's slop in the process. You just have to deal with it. And there you go. The reason I like this problem is that I'm and I, I sell this I sell this pretty aggressively in signals as well. Is that if you know the time properties of a circuit, then Everything you, need to, uh, everything you need to think about the circuit from a frequency perspective is contained in the, in the time representation. Like if you know this, this, the step response, you know the frequency response. Conversely, if I give you the frequency response, you can work out the time properties of the signal as well. You can tell me the time constant, you can tell me the, the, the natural frequency and so on. And they're related, right? One tells you everything you need to know about the other. Good stuff. All right. Questions? Oh, him, then you. Yes? Uh, friend of mine said, uh, explain the Nikon coefficient relates to the total frequency. Hold on. I gotta pull that up. Prelab 9. I don't think I have it. I have to get that off the blackboard. While I'm pulling this up off a of blackboard, there, there's a Friday lab, right? Yeah. What time is the Friday lab? After. After. Three. Starting one, at three. One. One to three. Yeah. After. Friday one to three in what room? Six, two, six, six, Friday one to three. Six, Friday, one to three. Room. Can you make it? Good. Came down. <laughs> We're gonna take some pictures of us touching circuits. I may, ha I may have to make an appearance as well. <laughs> I have a bow tie. I can wear the bow tie to lab. Okay, so you said pre-lab yes. 9? Okay, sorry, I pulled it up now. So, pre-lab 9, and what was the offending statement? It said, uh, explain the timing coefficient based on the total frequency. Please relate how the, what on earth is that? Oh, that's the sal and key low pass. Explain in your own words how the damping coefficient relates to the cutoff frequency and the gain. Okay, so I think he's talking, okay. So... Let's talk very briefly about the sound key filter and in doing so I'll answer your question. So again, I'm looking at pre-lab nine. So although Elliot drew it upside down and backwards, um, <laughs> to, his, to his credit, I think he was worried about just getting it done before the hurricane cut his power off. 
He was not really worried about aesthetics. Um, but, you know, it's a very nice drawing. Um, so the... Capacitor go. That's not right, is it? Oh no, it is right. <laughs> so this is a Salon key low pass filter. Okay, so let me just make this point. Salon key does not mean Butterworth or Chebyshev or Elliptic or anything. It is a circuit architecture. Okay, Salon key simply means this particular connection of op amps and capacitors and resistors. Okay, it's a circuit architecture. What it allows you to do is the following. It allows you to get a transfer function, and now of course I'm going to have to remember what that transfer function is off the top of my head. Uh, I'm going to go with S squared plus 3 minus G over RCS plus, help a guy out here, 1 over RC squared, and then 1 over RC squared in the numerator. G G over RC squared. That's not bad for guessing off the top of my head. Okay. So we did this one time derivation, right? The one time derivation figured out that that's the transfer function that goes with this circuit. It will always be the case, so you don't need to re derive it every time, right? It's, that's it. Like it's a one time beat down, right? We suffered the beat down, we have an answer. So, uh, quick question. What does, what does the gain, when I say gain, what gain am I referring to? The gain I'm referring to is the gain of this non-inverting op amp with resistors. So if I call this R1 and I call this R2, what is that gain? 1 plus R2 over R1. You don't need to resolve that every time you see it. It's a non-inverting op amp. It will always have that answer. Okay? Ditto voltage dividers. Ditto inverting op amps. The whole point is that you learn this nonsense once, and then you don't need to keep rederiving it. You can rederive it if you have a brain fart and you forget, okay, or you don't have your notes in front of you or whatever. But the point is, is to accelerate the process by sort of removing those lower level details because you only need to do them once. Okay, so what does this have to do with a Butterworth filter or a Chebyshev filter or an elliptic filter? Any, any takers on this? Sort of. So here's the deal. If, if you, so let's say for example you want to make a second order, let's say you want to make a second order low pass filter with a cutoff frequency of, I don't know, a thousand hertz. Okay? Yeah. So the, all the current goes through. Yeah. It goes through the, the whatever circuit. Oh, I see. Yeah, but I'm, okay, so that's true. I'm trying to make a different point. <laughs> no, 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 you're good. You're, 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 you're fine. Let me, let me just, let me do this. You go to make this. Okay, so you go to MATLAB and you say, help me design this filter. You go to the filter design tool, whatever. And it says, oh, yeah, 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 yeah sure. Second order, I can do that. Cut off frequency, I can do that. What do you want? Butterworth, Chebyshev. And you say, uh, okay, um, you say, I want Butterworth. It says, no problem. If you want a Butterworth filter, your poles go here. OK? Now, you say, no, I changed my mind. I, I want, a, I want a, a, an elliptic filter. It says, no problem. 
Uh, I'm moving your poles here. Okay, and you say, no, I want elliptic. It says, oh, make up your damn mind. Put the poles there. Okay, so it turns out that all the, the distinction of elliptic or uh, Butterworth or Chebyshev, all that distinction means is where the poles go. Okay, and by locating your poles in different places, you give your circuit different properties. Like we looked at the oscillations in the, time, in the pass band and the stop band and so on. So you give your circuit different properties, but at the end of the day, it's telling you, you want elliptic? Put your poles at these frequencies. You want Butterworth? Put your poles at these frequencies and so on. So then you come along and you say, okay, I've decided I want to go elliptic. MATLAB tells me I need to locate my poles at these frequencies. Now I need to build the circuit to do that. How do I do that? I use the Salen key architecture, and then I'm careful about how I choose my resistors and capacitors. And by choosing the resistors and capacitors properly, I can either put my poles here, or here, or here, and thereby get an elliptic, a Butterworth, or a Chevy Chev. So this is basically just a method to get you a pair of complex conjugate poles. That's it. Okay. All this does is gives you a pair of complex conjugate poles. Okay. Where those poles go is up to you. Right? You can get yourself any of the filter types that you want by by just removing the pole frequencies. Okay? And all that means is changing resistor and capacitor values. <coughs> Questions? So let's just discuss, to answer the question, let's discuss the relationship between the resistor, the capacitor, and the gain to zeta and omega naught. And to do that, it's actually not too bad. Let me just write down the characteristic equation again. So it's 2 plus. 3 minus G over RC S plus 1 over RC squared. So we happen to know that for any underdamped <coughs> second order circuit, the transfer function, the characteristic equation is S squared plus 2 zeta omega naught S plus omega naught squared. So, what's the relationship between omega naught and RC? Right. I mean, I know that these two terms have to be equal. Right? It's got to work out that way. Now, what else is going to be? Therefore, omega naught has to be one over RC. Is good. Likewise, I know those terms have to be equal. Let's see what that does for me. So according to that, 3 minus G over RC has to equal 2 zeta omega naught. And what is omega naught equal to? Right. It says omega naught, but this tells me that omega naught is actually equal to 1 over RC. So what's the relationship between zeta and my gain? Zeta equals 3 minus G over 2. Yes, sir. Is that even gain? If your gain is more than three, you don't have an underdamped system anymore. Uh, you, uh, you, yeah, then you would have an overdamped system. Let's think about that. If your gain was more, yeah, no, but then you you have the gain is in the numerator as well. Um, no, hold on, let me think about that. That's a good question. 
if you so the question is if gain was more than three, what would happen? Because I mean, just right there, this is three minus two or two. I mean, right. Make zeta negative. So that would make zeta negative. Well, there's no. I mean, that's what I mean. But, right. But, but zeta is zeta was defined as. Well, let me rephrase. This ex. Well, let me think about this. That's a good question. It deserves a good answer. Um, what happens if I make my gain bigger? I get a negative zeta. I'm going to get you an answer to that. I don't know. Um, but now I'm really curious to find out. Thank you. Okay. So thanks for screwing up my day. <laughs> um, but I'm really curious now. What would happen if game was bigger than three? Okay, I had other things I was going to do today, but you know, this is awesome. Okay, good. And um, so that's the relationship between the resistor capacitor value and the gain. So what's nice about the sound and key circuit is it actually makes it very easy to um, to get to, to independently set omega naught and and zeta. Like what would be a real headache is if you decided you wanted to change your zeta. So you change the resistor value, and in doing so, that also changed your omega naught, right? Whereas this way, they're like independent of each other. Once you pick your resistors and capacitors, you can independently set your zeta just by dialing your gain. So they're, they're kind of independent, which is nice. It makes it easy to, to update your circuit, uh, which is why it's a nice architecture. Okay, so the last question is, what if you wanted to know what the time constant of decay was, like we did in the previous problem? It's still 1 over zeta omega naught. So if you wanted to know the time constant, you could just put it together, or whatever that works out to. So it's actually, you know, when you go to design your lab, I think, it's actually straightforward. Like, once you know what, you, what zeta and omega naught you want, you just pick some combination of RC that gives you omega naught. You pick some gain that gives you the zeta that you need, and you're done, right? You build it and test it. So what if I gave you this transfer function, I filled in all the resistor and capacitor values, and I gave you a cosine at a specific frequency. I said, this circuit is being stimulated by a cosine at 40 hertz. Could you tell me what comes out of the circuit? Yeah, if I gave you all the resistor values and stuff. Yeah, how would you do it? Transfer function, right? If I put in a cosine at 40 hertz, what comes out? Cosine of 40 hertz. Here's another example of easy points and hard points. Okay? If I tell you the input's a cosine of 40 hertz, just tell me output's a cosine of 40 hertz. Okay? I'll give you partial credit for that. That takes zero time to do, and it's worth a decent number of points, like maybe half. Just conceptually, that's valuable. Okay? Then if you wanted to know how much cosine you have at 40 hertz, you would have to take this expression, substitute in S equals J omega, where omega equals 2 pi 40, and then yank on the calculator until you figured out what phasor-wise, what the magnitude and phase are of this thing. The magnitude would tell you the amp, how much cosine, and the phase would tell you the phase angle of the cosine. But you could do it. All right. I would get comfortable doing that. Right. You should get comfortable plugging frequencies into this and getting getting answers out. I will ask you to do one of those. It's a basic phasor manipulation. You should be able to do it. We've done them in class. Remember that day we made the whole table? Like we had a low pass filter, we subbed in values, and everybody was like banging away on their calculators, and we calculated what the output cosines were. We will do that exam. We will do that on Friday. When I say we, I actually mean you. <laughs> you had a question. Yeah, I had a question from the old exam. Okay. The old, like the 2006 exam? Okay, which problem? Oh, hold on, I think it's hilarious that I'm going to remember where I put that file. Yeah, uh, oh, it's in the exam session, good. Uh, old exam, here it is. Oh, by the way, as this pulls up, we're going to do the same thing we did for the first exam where we're going to split into two groups. Go to the same exam place where you went last time, okay? If you took the exam, what was it, 701, 702, whatever that lab was upstairs where you took the exam, Go back there again. 
If you took the exam here, come here again, right? That way we can spread out, open book, open note. You have room to actually get out all your notes. Okay, I have exam one pulled up. What am I doing? Just number one. Uh, number one. The one that says solve for the complete solution for VC of T. Could be. Could be. All right, well, hold on. Let me just take a quick look at this. See if I remember what I'm doing. I'm telling you, you guys have the benefit of experience. I still can't believe some of the nonsense I had people do on exams when I was young and idealistic. My first semester at Temple, I, they, they made me teach a, uh, well, they made me teach a bunch of stuff, but one of the courses I taught was a, uh, it was like a two semester hour course, some sort of like throwaway MATLAB thing. I taught it like it was the biggest course any of these students ever had. We had like homeworks and projects and it was, I was running like a five credit hour course and people complained. <laughs> awesome. Okay. Um, so I've got a resistor and an inductor, a resistor and a capacitor. So I've got a resistor, an inductor, a resistor and a capacitor. And that's going to a current source. <laughs> so I've got a half minus a quarter U of T. Let's see if I remember how to do this. Four, two, eight, and a sixteenth. Sixteenth, mind you. 4, 2, 8, and a 16. And what do I want to know? The capacitor voltage is a function of time. <laughs> What's wrong with me? Yes? What say? Which part? One sixteenth. That's the capacitance. Okay, so is this, um, we'll do this because it's, um, okay, is this a phasers problem? Here's a fun question. Would this, exam, would this question have belonged on exam one or exam two? Two. Three. <laughs> Is it a phaser question? Thank you. See you on Friday? Yeah. Okay. Um, phasers require cosines. Phasers have to do with magnitudes and phases of cosines. Do you see a cosine? No. Yes, sir. Is that one-fourth U of T? One-fourth U of T. It's the step function. There are no cosines here. It is not a phasor question. It is a first order step response question. I'm happy to do it, but you know what I'm saying? Like it's just, but it's important to at least understand what tools you have to throw at it. Okay? There are no cosines, so don't phasor it. Yes, sir. So we don't need to review these No, no. If you don't, if you, I'm happy to do it. But if you'd rather use your remaining. 10 minutes on something else, I'd be happy to do something else. But I'm actually glad that you, I had, you had me write it up here, because it is interesting to talk about, you know, is it a phaser problem or is it just like a time constant problem? And it's definitely a time constant problem, because there's nothing oscillating. Right, you rip it as in a half. And then it's at a quarter. So it's just a first order. Yeah. Yeah. So you just have to figure out the voltage in the cap before t equals zero, which you get when the when the, the current is a half. And then if t goes to infinity after zero, your input current will be a half minus a quarter to quarter. So then you figure out what the final cap voltage is. And then from there, would you have to correct the voltage since it's the cap? Well, 
No, so what you would do in this case is, like, let's say for, for, for negative time, when, when your input's a half, you know that once the surgery reaches steady state, there's no current going through this cap, and it's inductor shorts. So your entire half, half amp is going to go through this, through this guy. So half an amp going through four ohms gives you two volts here, and therefore two volts here, and therefore two volts here. So your VC for negative time is two volts. Your VC for um, positive time, so you go, from, so from negative time, you have two volts. After that, for positive time, like after the circuit settled out, using the same arguments, because you have half the input, your output will be one volt. And then the only question is, how does it get from two volts to one volt? And it's going to do some sort of RC decay. And that RC decay is probably going to be set by this resistor and that capacitor, I'm guessing. But that's, you'd have to work that out. Yeah. That, please, that, that, why do we have... Twenty parallel with negative ten. How do I get like negative two hundred zero over twenty parallel? Negative ten J. There's a good question. All right, I'd make you do that. Twenty parallel with negative ten J. You got one too. Can we keep those phases in degrees? Can we keep the angles in degrees? Yeah, that's fine. You can keep phase angles in degrees if it makes more sense. Yeah, I have one for number 42 in the homework. All right, well, let me just do this real quick, then we'll do that. And then we'll probably call it a day. Product over sum, right? So the product is minus 200J over 20 minus 10J. That's how you put things in parallel. Okay. Yeah. From, from there, how, how I get 4 minus 10J? Like All right, how do you do that division? Polar form. I mean, there's, there's a couple ways you can do it, but really the most realistic way is, is, um, is polar form. So your numerator is basically, your, in polar form, your numerator is 200 angle minus 90. So now you have to take your denominator and convert it to polar form. So it's going to be 20 squared plus 10 squared, square root. So 20 squared is 400. 10 squared is 100. Add them together, you get 500. So 500 is 10 root 5 angle, I don't know, whatever that angle is, right? It's going to be inverse tangent of negative 10 over 20. So you take this, convert it to polar form, divide the magnitudes, subtract the phases, and that'll be your answer. Divide the magnitude, I don't get 4 minus. You don't get what now? I, I, I don't get that it's a 4 minus 8J. What do you get? Four? Where, where are you getting this 4 minus 8J from? Oh, that's what's in the solution? Well, fine. So let's do this problem. Let's actually finish this. So if you take 200 divided by 10 root 5, where am I? 200, 10 root 5, uh, so times divide. So it gives me 8.9 angle. And then I'm going to take uh, negative 10 over 20, and I'm going to take the um, inverse tan of that. So that's negative 26.5 degrees. So this is negative 26.5. So it'll be minus 90 minus negative 26.5, right, so it's plus. So that gives me negative 63 degrees. Are this and this the same number? If you convert this to polar form, what do you get? Four square, four, eight, plus, Square root. You're not going to believe this. If you convert this number to polar form, you get 8.9 angle. 8 sine 4 divide negative 
It's the same thing. <coughs> so how are you converting that like four four sign? <laughs> I'm not following. Yes. On the test, if you just, uh, you know how you said 25 after that, if you just plug it in calculator, right? it gives you the final answer. You have to show work for that. Yeah, you should show work, so I at least know that you, I mean, you don't have to like do every step, but at least set it up okay. so I know like, that you know what to do. Does your calculator actually do that? Yeah. Nice. So, you know, you have to know what you Yeah, because you can't do this unless you know that. But if your calculator does it, that's fine. That's a tool. So and you can do the first step to the minus two hundred, you know, You'd have to write, yeah, you'd have to, yeah. I'd set it up, and then if you can plug it into your calculator, that's fine. But there's no excuse for getting the wrong answer, though, you know what I'm saying? Like, you should at least have enough, in, my point is, you should have enough intuition. The reason we learn to do things by hand is that if you get an answer that doesn't make any, like, sometimes you punch things in the calculator wrong, you miss a minus sign or something, and the answer comes out totally incorrect. You should have enough intuition, because you know how to do the answer by hand, that you can look at it and say, Wait a minute. There's no way that could be right. And then that's so that's I think where the value is. There is just so you know, there is another way of getting the right answer without having to do the polar form. Does anybody remember what it is? Screw TI eighty nine. Multiply the numerator and the denominator by twenty plus ten J, the complex conjugate. So in the denominator, you'll get twenty squared um, plus ten squared. That's 500, and the imaginary parts are equal and opposite, and they cancel. So now you've got some nonsense over 500, and in the numerator you get what you get. You just foil it, and then you'll. I think if you simplify, you'll wind up getting that. That's the other standard trick for dividing by complex numbers. Either way, we're learning to do it in calculus. I'm happy to answer your question if you want to talk after class. Just we're we're kind of running out of time. And you had a question over there too. Oh, you had a question for me. Come see me after class, office hours. I should be in and out of my lab all afternoon, and I should be around tomorrow. I'm guessing after 2 o'clock I'll be here writing your exam. So come visit me. Um, give me ideas. <laughs>